Well, hello and thank you for watching today's service from First Congregational Church. And I would just take a little time here to thank all those who are helping or assisting with uh, the service. Sarah is our liturgist, uh, Carol our choir director, we also have Sharon playing the piano, Linda our organist, and then Jason and Wayne Stone serving as our sound engineers and videographers. So thank, I just want to thank all of you for everything you do in making uh, this service possible. Well, we are in the presence of the Spirit to praise and worship God that we may be transformed into the likeness of Christ. May we know the challenge and the glory of living with Jesus on this Lenten journey. We will now sing our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. join me in the gathering prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that we can rest in you, secure amid the uncertainty and challenges of life. We thank you that you provide for our needs and that you have trusted us to one another's care. Receive our thanks and praise as we worship and adore you. Amen. Welcome to this online service where no matter who you are or where you are, on life's journey, you are welcome to worship. May the peace of Christ be with you. I would like to share the following announcements with you. Next week on Palm Sunday, March 28th, you are invited to gather for worship in the sanctuary. You will need to make a reservation to attend the Palm Sunday service and services thereafter. Please make your reservation before 11 a.m. this Friday, March 26th. Everyone in attendance will need to wear a mask and practice social or physical distancing. If you are not comfortable attending in-person worship services, you can watch a recording of the service later in the day. In-person worship services will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. There will be no coffee fellowship following the service. We will have special midweek services, including Wandy Thursday and Good Friday. They will not be in person. Those services will be posted on our YouTube channel. Links to the videos will be sent to you via in email. Contact the church office for more information. We continue with our Wednesday fellowship and Lenten exploration of the passion of Jesus. This Wednesday, March 24th at 9.30 a.m. via Zoom. Invite a friend, grab your coffee or favorite morning beverage, and join us via Zoom for good fellowship, a few laughs, and inspiration. 
Our fifth midweek Lenten evening prayer service with First Presbyterian Church will be available for viewing Wednesday, March 24th, any time after 6 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Link to the online service will be sent to you via email. If you or someone you know could use some help registering for a COVID-19 vaccination, please contact the church office. We have people in our congregation who are able and willing to assist you with the registration process. Our first reading this morning is from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make will be with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach a neighbor to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Our second reading is from John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They, were, they went to Philip. He was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said, Sir, we went to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am. And my Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But that is why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring your glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, it was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. May God bless our hearing and understanding of these readings from God's word. God's goodness is the only goodness that is non-exclusive. Human goodness, our goodness, usually tends to be exclusive. God's goodness includes all, sometimes ours does not. In an interview, a minister told a story that illustrates what I mean. He told of a man with whom he had shared an automobile accident. Well, it wasn't exactly shared a car wreck. What it really was, the man had been careless and had crashed right into the minister's car. Well, to top that off, the man used uh, profanity. He was verbally abusive. And then the minister said he looked the man right in the eye, right in the middle of all that swearing, and said, Mr., God loves you, and I'm trying. Non-exclusive good is the property of God alone. Ours is at times exclusive. You see, war is a more common occurrence in the history of humankind than the signing of peace pacts before a war begins. It's as though there is something inside us human beings which limits the extent of our goodness. 
Human goodness is sometimes exclusive. Mister, God loves you, and I'm trying. Well, God's goodness is non-exclusive, and in the new covenant predicted by Jeremiah, God forgives and forgets our sin. Now, I'd like to refresh your memory about Jeremiah's time and circumstances. I recall, I recall an, amusing, an, an amusing comment about Jeremiah by someone in a discussion group during a Western Association meeting. And the discussion began with someone asking us, what do you know about Jeremiah? And someone shot back the answer, he cried a lot, referring to the lamentations of Jeremiah, or as some refer to him, the weeping prophet. But Jeremiah did more than just cry a lot or weep. His preaching and his pleas for social reforms and religious reforms got him into so much trouble that he barely escaped death several times. Just listen to some excerpts from his sermons. You see, he had come to the conclusion that his nation and its people were almost beyond hope. So here's what he said in different parts of the the book. He called them crooks with no exceptions or slag that couldn't be refined into steel or rushing to their death like a cavalry charge that couldn't be stopped, or they couldn't do the good any more than a leopard changes her spots. And one time he asked, who could understand the human heart? He says, there is nothing else so deceitful, it is too sick to be healed. On and on Jeremiah goes Jeremiah's blunt way of telling it like he saw it. And then came that infamous year, 587 B.C. Now, Jeremiah's nation of Judah had been nipping at the heels of mighty Babylon once too often, and Nebuchadnezzar came through Judah, leaving a path of destruction and death that destroyed this uh, little, proud, sinful nation. All hope gone. But before when they were hoping in their prosperity and their military might, Jeremiah had been preaching doom. It was doomsday for them in 587, and now, of all things, Jeremiah preaches hope. This crying, lamenting, weeping doomsday prophet had been preaching hopelessness in the midst of what they thought was the most hopeful period in the life of the nation. And now, in the, in the most hopeless of times, Jeremiah is preaching hope. You see, he knew something they didn't know. He knew of God's non-exclusive goodness. Jeremiah also knew that God's goodness bears even more fruit when human beings work for those things that are valued to God in God's realm, which means working for all people everywhere, no matter who they are uh, or wherever they are, that all people are beloved children of God. And you see, God is a dreamer of impossible dreams. At least that's the way it seems to us. You know, one would think that God would know better than to place too much trust in us human beings. You know, the events just before the flood had already taxed God's patience beyond limit. And even so, God places the bow in the clouds, in the sky, to guarantee that never again will humanity be destroyed by the flood. It is to serve as a reminder to God of God's promise. And no sooner had he liberated the Jews from slavery in Egypt and they had escaped scot-free from the Pharaoh than the the Hebrews wanted to return to the slavery of Egypt rather than risk the trials of the wilderness. But God frequently sustained them with fresh water from rocks and manna from heaven. But no sooner had the people finally come to Mount Sinai and their leader Moses had gone to the top of the mountain to speak with God, than they built a golden calf to the moon god. And God could have given up on the people, but God's patient love prevailed. 
On and on goes the story of the fickleness of the people of faith, and it is our story as well. You see, every time people of faith start taking the glory or the credit for themselves, they usually end up being humbled. You know, it happened over and over again to the Hebrews, and it has happened over and over again to the church and to the individual. But God never breaks covenants. Sometimes people, we human beings, do break covenants. God's love is non-exclusive as is God's goodness. But that's not always the case with us. You know how quickly we run after those things that are finite, not lasting, and then we usually end up existentially disappointed. But what a dreamer God is, willing to establish a new covenant. A new covenant that will be so much a part of each person that you won't even need anyone to teach it to you. A new covenant that will be so pure in the relationship between God and the people that there will be, that there will be instant communication and full obedience. Yes, God is a dreamer who will forgive and forget. Have amnesia when it comes to our brokenness. And God's dream is for the redemption of all people. All people are created equal in the sight of God. And that's how we are to live out God's vision in our life and world. And you know, God's dream is for all, but you know, God doesn't force us into it. We sometimes have to come on our own. I came across a very, very uh, touching, powerful story that happened to a human family that illustrates on a human level what Jeremiah claims for God in the new covenant, the divine level. You see, there was a family whose young daughter was killed by a reckless driver, and this driver was very young. I don't know, got in a car, I don't know how, uh, around, I don't know, 12, 13. He came from a family with a history of problems. He was really on the road to a life of crime and brokenness. Well, Instead of being bitter and revengeful, the parents of the daughter made a faith decision to make this boy a part of their family. They became for him the family he had never known. Their redemptive love gave him a fresh start in life. And the family knew that if nothing separates us from the love of God, then nothing releases us from the right the obligations which God's love gives us either. I don't know if I could have been that loving. I hope so, but I I don't know. Perhaps I could forgive, but I doubt I could forget. But God does both. You know, I'm usually more like the seminary student studying for the ministry, walking to class and comments to his friend. You know, our seminary president said, we don't have to like everyone, but we have to love them. That part gets, that the part he says that gets me is this loving everyone, whether you like them or not. Does it get you? It does me. Mister, God loves you, but I'm trying. God's non-exclusive goodness and love is what we can rest our hopes on, not on our goodness and love. We may never attain that kind of forgiving and forgetting, but there is a way that we can take a giant step toward it. And for that, we can turn to our text in John's 12th chapter. Jesus said it loud and clear. We must hate self if we are to be saved. We must hate that within ourselves which causes us to look down on, harm, injure, or not accept our neighbor no matter who they are. We must hate that within ourselves, which separates us from other people. We must hate that which destroys our empathy, love, and sense of responsibility for others. You know, Jesus used strong images to wake us up to what matters most in God's realm. I, I, I'm like the donkey that has to be hit over the head with a two-by-four just to get my attention. Well, Jesus shocks us by saying, if we hate self, we are safe for eternal life. That gets my attention. Well, when we break 
the covenant. Don't be surprised. It happens over and over again. I'm not surprised when it happens, but I do know remorse and regret over it. And that's why I worship. Worship of God reminds me that God forgives and forgets. And in Christ, we experience God's all-inclusive goodness and love. It is this one, this Jesus, who through the hard school of suffering shows us that God is indeed the source of our salvation and healing. Amen, and may God bless us all. And now you're invited to think of any particular needs, joys, concerns that you might have as we observe a moment of silent meditation. Gracious God, we pause and acknowledge your presence in our lives. Remind us that you love us dearly. Remind us that your covenant with us has always been to embrace us and not to punish us. Penetrate our barriers and our false pride whenever we become overcome by self-condemnation. And take us by the hand. Lead us in your ways. Help us to discover meaningful ways of losing our lives for your sake. And now we turn our thoughts away from ourselves as we now focus on the entire human family. We so often do not have the vision to include everyone in it, 
and we witness so much brokenness and violence. So we pray for peace in all corners of the earth. We pray for less bitterness among, among different groups or factions or tribes or nations. We pray for those whose lives are lived in poverty. And we pray for those for whom the doors of opportunity are closed. We pray for the ill, the hurting, and grieving. Remedy the wrongs of this world. Give us the vision of a world in which we demonstrate our covenant with you by also demonstrating your love toward our neighbors. And give us the will to work for the day when all peoples of the earth have food, education, health, and the opportunity to fulfill themselves. And help us to provide healing for the brokenness of all your children. We pray these things in Jesus' name, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now sing our closing hymn, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. These are the gifts we ask of thee, spirit serene, strength for the daily task, courage to face the road, good cheer to help us bear the traveler's load, and for the hours of rest that come between, that come between an inward joy of all things heard and seen. So go into this week brimming over with the grace of God, nourished by the love of Jesus Christ, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>